Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. With us in the studio is garden designer Nancy Gosley Power and photographer Grant Mudford. Nancy's going to tell us how to plant a garden with color and with different materials, and she's going to show us some before and after uh, of gardens that she's already done. But first, tell us how this career got started, Nancy. Um, this career got started in my parents' back garden. <laughs> uh, when I was a child, I dug everything up. Is that right? I redesigned our back garden all the time. And where was that? This is in Lower Delaware, right at the Maryland border, kind of in what's known as Tidewater area. Most of the year, it's, it's underwater. It's so low. I was going to say, did you have to dig it up because it was always <laughs> wet? <laughs> oh, uh, we had two houses. We had a beach house and a townhouse. And we would go to the beach for the summer. And um, every year, I had gardens. And when I wasn't building gardens, I was building forts or special places in the woods or special places underneath the stairs. In other words, I've always been interested in, in special places. And that is um, something that is really clear in my work. But also, evidently, using different kinds of materials if you were building forts and digging up your Absolutely. gardens. Absolutely. Trying, trying every, every uh, material that was available wherever I was, and that, that holds true today. So if we talk about a, a, a Nancy Power garden, it, they have um, little places that are like meditation places, or what, what else would you explain it as? Well, well if you're highly romantic like I am. You're always thinking of the possibilities, what can I do in the garden? Mm -hmm. Now that, of course, your imagination can go quite wild there. You can have a cup of tea and be very quiet with your cat. You can make lots and lots of uh, messes and, and, have, and work in your garden yourself and tear things up. But you could also have really quiet places and you could have places to make love, to have little trysts. Um, and I'm always thinking about those those human needs that we have. Do and those little places call for special kinds of flowers or special kinds of planting? Well, I think one of the, one of the tricks of a, of a special place, particularly one that you want to be sort of secret, is to have wonderful fragrance someplace that you can't, oh. you don't know where it comes from. It's it's tucked away, and I often don't tell my clients that I've done this, and they'll say, there's this amazing smell back in the garden. So it's something you don't even have to see. No. It's an atmosphere that you're creating. Your garden, garden design is theater. Ah, that's a good way to look at it. And you're designing a set for people to live in. And hopefully, you. when I work, I feel like I'm going to, I hope I'm going to feel like that they'll have a better life because of what I've done for them. Can you do it anywhere or do you have to have a big space? No, the, the, the key is you don't have to do it anywhere. In fact, some of my most treasured gardens are tiny little spaces. You'll see in my own garden when we looked at photographs, there's, there's a secret garden and it's not very large. I've done gardens in spaces this size. Is that right? Yes. You could actually plant things? But sure. And you have one <laughs> little chair and one little cat and it will be just, just charming. <laughs> Tell us, when you, when you were talking about the different kinds of materials. What materials do you use? I know I think the typical, one of the things everyone was using in gardens, I don't know, over the past 10 years are railroad ties. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have never used a railroad tie. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're just the wrong size and they, they don't attach to anything. And I like my stairs, for example, if you're using railroad ties, to feel as if they come out of the ground itself. So either I use, I, if, I, if, I, if the budget allows, I love to use stone. Stone is my favorite material. Are there certain kinds of stone? Well, I like to choose stone that, that's native to where the site is, oh, I see. or is close to native. And I like to use colors that relate to the local dirt color, mm -hmm. i.e. if the soil is a red soil like it is in Virginia, or like it is in Georgia where I'm going to be working very soon, then a red stone is appropriate. Unless, of course, you're after some sort of weird kind of design where you're doing red and black or tan and red or some sort of combination. But I always go to the soil color first. That applies to the, to the color of the house. I often do the house colors as well. We're talking about individual residences. Do you have certain demands by the person who oh, owns the house? Of course. Now, I mean, you, you might say to me, Nancy, I really 
hate insects, and I really don't want to be outside with the bugs. This is if you live on the East Coast, particularly where their mosquitoes are rampant. We would make a garden that might be involved with a porch. Oh, I see. And so the garden would come right up to the porch, and you'd have your little screened area, but and we bring some plants inside in pots. So you'd have, have it, indoor, yeah, exactly, outdoor. indoor. And you could do that the same thing with a little building, a summer house or a gazebo um, or some little shelter in the garden, too. Are there certain influences from outside? Are you influenced by paintings or um, by gardens from the past? I am influenced by everything. And I think it's very important, um, the more aware you are of everything, the better the designer you are. And, and in the past, I've worked as a food editor. Um, um, I worked for Food and Wine. I've been an editor for House Beautiful. I've been an interior designer. Um, I'm a mother. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm passionate about music. I love to hike. I love to explore. I'm just excited about life. So you can bring those personalities into each, into a different garden, yes. or the personality of the person who's asked you to do it. That's, I, I, the gardens that I design are not my gardens. They're really the gardens that belong to the people that, that hire me. And those gardens are only as good as the client will allow me. The, 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 it's the relationship between the two of us. And um, the, the best gardens obviously come from the people that I have the most rapport with. Now it's very difficult for me to work with someone who wants everything perfect and clean and, and very controlled because that's not possible in a garden. I was going to ask you about that. Can you, do you, can you plant it and say, this is the way I want it to look and walk away and it'll stay like that? Well, you know from experience yourself, it's not <laughs> never turns out the way you don't think it's going to turn out. Sometimes it's better and it often surprises you and sometimes it's a disaster. Uh, I mean, garden design is really the black art. We don't really know what we're doing. What about color? Oh, color. Color is anything you want it to be. And you can use all colors. There's no bad color. Uh, can you mix them all, too? You can. Uh, the more colors you're using, the more difficult the design. I mean, uh, throw blue into your flower arrangement here, and it becomes a different thing. Yeah. And that's compatible because all those colors are, are warm. It's like your sweater looks good with it because it's the same kind of families. So you do the same, same you use thing. the same kind of color palette or you, you have a color palette sensibility when you do a garden. Well, if you look at what I have on today, mm -hmm. these are colors that I often use in California because this is the color of our natural chaparral, our, our native plant material. And they're, they're subtle. The colors in California aren't um, bright. They're dull. They're somber. Um, we have we have green, but it's a real dull green. But we have a lot of plants the color of your vest. Absolutely. <laughs> which are great, <laughs> and the difference in the variations yes. make. But I'm looking at your, um, your, your slacks, and I see a brown thumb there. What happens if a person has a brown <laughs> thumb? How do we get through our garden? Well, I, th I think the brown, pro the brown thumb syndrome is because the people aren't being observant of what is growing in their neighborhood. Ah, so you have to think about the whole the area. The whole thing. Learn, what you're, learn your trees. Think about, um, what, look at things really carefully. Now that plant looks really fabulous there. Why does it look so fabulous? Well, it's a Maybe shade. Maybe it was brought in. Well, it could have been brought in. <laughs> But, but the point is, if it's in a shade garden and it really looks great in the shade, uh -huh. obviously that's a, sh a great shade plant. Oh, I see. And then the same with sun? Absolutely. And gray foliage in California, the reason we have so much of it is because it's tougher. It reflects the sun. If you have a great big leaf, like this size, it doesn't hold up well with the sun. It's too harsh. Oh, so those always are in the shady areas, They're shady in the areas and they're more tropical. Oh, it's pretty, it's common sense. It's definitely common sense. Well, we have some before and afters that you were going to show us. Oh, Can yes. we look at some of those? Let's put one up here. Oh, she um, has a certain, she wants to choose a I'm certain gonna do one. I'm going to do a certain way here. Okay. Um, this is the second garden for a client of mine in Montecito. The first one we did was a Victorian house. It was very overgrown, very, very busy, very full, very much what we would consider the English style, which is very high maintenance. Um, and it also needed a lot of water. And in her second house, she was a uh, much, much smaller house and decided she wanted a more typical California garden. Now, when, when we say English garden, what we really mean is overblown, abundant, full. And uh, you can do that with, with our native plants and plants that are from climates like ours, mm -hmm. i.e. The, the Mediterranean world and parts of Australia, New Zealand, uh, um, let's Those see. make up an English garden. Well, it's it's I mean, the, it's the, the style. It's, it's the style. Um, but is it sculptural? 
Um, well, my work tends to be more sculptural. The, the, this garden is not so sculptural and it's more fluid, which is why, one reason I showed it first, because everyone always says the English garden. Okay, Because that's their see. great art. So where do we start? Okay, this is the front of a, a little house and, and we built a new wall. And I really feel that, that gardens should be enclosed because that gives you the sense of privacy, of um, security from the outside world, which as we're learning more and more about it through the media, <laughs> is uh, pretty threatening. So we enter the garden down a little path, and this is what the path looked like before. And there it is looking across. That This little table and chairs is right there. I see. Okay. So that's your before. And, the t and then we go to the path. And then the path is made up of tile and very simple. And then along the path we've had rosemary. Um, and then we built this looking sort of this way, this bench would be right there. Mm. It's a very full garden. It's, it has a color palette of peaches and, and yellows and oranges and grays. You put water in. Uh, the piece of water in the California garden is really essential. Um, Doesn't it bring bugs? Oh, but you put fish in the pond that eat the bugs. I see. It brings wonderful <laughs> dragonflies. Just, we had this incredible Chinese red one here that's just I terrific. See. I see. But I think in a dry climate, um, water is sacred. Water I has see. always been a problem in California, we right. know from the past, and hence water is always in my garden. So you put, oh, and all, oh, oh, so that could be that, a Nancy Power That could Power be a Nancy Power thumb thing. Point, thumbprint. <laughs> Stolen from the, the great gardens of, of the Mediterranean world. The English don't need so much water because they have it every day. I see. Um, oh, yeah, they have rain. This is the front of the house, a rather plain, ordinary house. And with that material, it, has, it, it all of a sudden has some personality. Is it expensive to buy all this plant material and landscape a garden? Yes, it is expensive. It's, it's, it's particularly expensive if you want instant gratification. The thing is, you've written a book. Um, does that explain how a person can do it themselves? No. Oh, it does? No. Uh. That's... I think my next book will be more about design and, and how things are done. This book is an overview of the history of California gardens. Let's do another one quickly before we... Um, let's go to the Schnabel House. This is a very, very contemporary house built by uh, architect Frank Gehry. Um, Frank's client, Marna Schnabel, wanted an English garden. And of course, Frank was horrified. Frank <laughs> loves this <laughs> with this house. And Frank either likes grass or decomposed granite, which is this material right here, which mm -hmm. is typical California dirt. And so we had to have a compromise. Marna says, I really want an English garden. But can you imagine this garden with pink roses all over it? This house. This house. Right. It'd be really a disaster. And so what we did was do a California garden in the English style. Ah. So hence this, this border is full of all sorts of things, but they're drought tolerant and they're a little bit tougher because with Frank's building, you can't put soft sort of feminine material because it just doesn't look right because it's so strong architecturally that you have to do something that, that complements it in another way. Um, looking, you can see the difference here. Uh, in the back. And yeah. then a close up here of what that looks like. That's where it shows more Englishly, but it's again California material. And here's your natural water. You have a lap pool. It's a lap so pool. So you didn't have to put a water no. in. No. No. Actually, I really love to put a pool in the middle of the olive grove right here. Um, but we haven't done that yet. But Sometimes so you have your water and you have your reflection and you have the. Um, Drought resistant plants, yes. California plants. California plants. Yeah, Frank Gehry's design takes me to the um, Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles, and you have been chosen to do the landscape. Uh, I call it architecture, but landscape. It, it, well, it is it is it is landscape architecture um, in a way. But I really consider myself a garden artist, and um, Frank, after several projects, has gotten used to working with me and knows that my job is to make his building. Enhances building in any, in any way that I can. Well, what will be the main thrust of planting around Disney Hall? Well, it's going to be strong and structural, and it has decomposed um, uh -huh. paths. The paths are all made of dirt, uh, off the main paths. Uh -huh. We have to have stone for all the codes. Uh -huh. But then we go off into the garden, and it's very much like, like a garden you might find anywhere in California. Will it be already grown? Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that's what everyone wants, we, right? We, uh, <laughs> we're trying to make it uh, make our material as large as possible. I see. And I am used to putting instant gratification into a garden because I work for a lot of people in Hollywood and television. 
and television is instant. Yes, we all like that. We're all here. Spoiled. I think we all like that. Yes. We thank you for being with us today, Nancy. And uh, don't go away because we have photographer Grant Mudford coming on. And uh, I think he's probably photographed some of Nancy's uh, uh, gardens. Absolutely. <laughs> so he has. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with photographer Grant Mudford. He was born in Sydney, Australia, and studied architecture at the University of South Wales. Uh, from 1965 to 1964, he worked on all types of commercial photography, as well as being a cinematographer um, on uh, several films. I never knew that about him until I read his bio. The Australian Council for the Arts granted him a travel and work program for the United States and the grant was in 1974 and again in 1977. Correct. What did those grants mean to you? Well, at the time they were, uh, it was a great opportunity to um, get out of Australia and uh, forget, <coughs> forget the commercial photo studio that I was running in Australia at the time. I was doing a lot of advertising photography. Um, Architecture was something I was interested in, but um, I was uh, at the time I left Australia. I was I was very a very active uh, commercial photographer, doing a lot of advertising and magazine editorial work. So my interest in in photography as an art form was great, and and uh, but was not really practiced uh, in Australia as such. So um, a lot of the art and art photography that I was interested in was coming out of America. So I was interested in coming here and. I, do, I wasn't sure for what period of time, but just to indulge myself in an, in an environment where it existed. So uh, I applied, that was the basis for my grant, and uh, it was given to me from the Visualizer Board. But what happened was, you were in commercial. You were doing a lot of commercial work, but you got, in fact, a grant for fine arts from the Fine Arts Council, which is very prestigious. Mm -hmm. They must have looked at your work in a certain way and thought you could do it. Well, I was yes, I did have... Um, I did have some, somewhat of a track record as an artist. I, I'd shown in, a, in Sydney uh, for two or three years before I left. Basically, most of the photography that I had seen and the photography that's been in international magazines and House and Garden, House Beautiful, Vanity Fair, all kinds of publications besides publications that are made just for the trade, um, your work is very architectural. And I never realized that you had that architecture background. Well, the three years that I spent in architecture school in, in Sydney was really a turning point, uh, uh, not so much in that it, uh, you know, turned me into an architect. Uh, I mean, it certainly, uh, I, I maintain an interest in architecture to this day. Um, the important thing, thing was the introduction to the art world. There were some very, very interesting artists oh. who were teach. it was a very advanced uh, school at the time. They had some very far out artists who were teaching there. Um, a lot of which had nothing, you know, a lot of the artists really who taught there had nothing to do with architecture. They were just free thinkers and... Oh, that's interesting. So it was a revelation uh, and it was really my first, ex my first uh, experience with artists and a um, very oh. exciting period for oh, me. I, but then also the other that, thing I didn't know was that you had made films. Yeah, not, you mentioned several films. I made a few. Uh, most of them I would classify as sort of art films and, and uh, none of which got a commercial release outside of uh, film festivals, I would say. But the idea was you were making them and you were, you were lauded for your lighting techniques. Right, I did win an, a lighting award from the Australian Film Awards uh, for one of them, the first one actually. <laughs> and I think the only reason it was so effective uh, was the fact that it was such a, a bare bones production uh, I had one light to work oh. with, so I lit the entire film with one light. So I think, uh, but, but I think there's a lot to say for simplicity in lighting too. I think that's true because when I went on the set with George Harrell, the great photographer from the '40s in Hollywood motion pictures, and he had two lights. Mm -hmm. He just threw one up against this way and one over there, and I went, George, is that it? And he got his shadows and he got everything that he wanted from that. Yes, well, there's a lot to say for the purity of, of one light source. I mean, we. We, um, 
I mean, we experience it with the sun, the sun every day. It's basically a single light source. So. Uh, talking about the, the light source and the opening of your camera, someone was asking you before we came on the show what f-stop you used, and I thought your answer was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I tend to work very simply, and um, uh, in fact, a lot of my a lot of my work, I know what the f-stop is because it was it was the same for many years, and. Uh, Basically, because I'd simplified my my, uh, the te my the technical way in which I worked, uh, so that I could really concentrate on what I was doing with the images, and I work with very simple equipment and basically use the same lighting and the same um, technique. And F8, I know, was my f-stop for <laughs> five years. Is that the most open? Is that the no? F8 is sort of <laughs> F8 is um, sort of av average for a 35 millimeter camera. <laughs> So, very average technique. Now, the other thing, you talk about average, but I think it all depends on the eye, because as we can see on the paintings, on the, I call them paintings, because to me, I have a collection of your work, and mm -hmm. they are paintings to me. Um, well, it's they, the eye, mm -hmm. and it's the... Um, well, it's a drama. It's like making films. Now that I see that background in your in in your past, I see that film. Each thing tells a story. Right. Well, there is uh, the, one of the magical things about photography to me is, particularly in black and white, it's enhanced in black and white. Is that is that transformation that takes place when things are photographed. So let's talk about this one. Well, <clears throat> this is typical of a lot of the work I did in the late seventies, in that I was. I was concentrating on what most people would consider very unpromising subject matter. <laughs> this is basically the back lot, uh, the back uh, loading dock of an industrial space somewhere in Southern California. I can't remember where, Irvine maybe. Uh, so what I really enjoy doing is enhancing these things in a very uh, sort of iconic way uh, through the medium of photography. So hopefully they transcend their mundaneness and, um, and, and commonality uh, to become something else as a photograph. Well, talking about an icon, this uh, photograph is the Max Factor building, mm -hmm. which was an icon in Hollywood. Right. But you took it and um, made something that we can remember because I don't think it's like that anymore. No, I think it's been, I think a lot of the uh, facade has been uh, removed and damaged, um, and uh, it would be impossible to take that photograph anymore. I think a lot of, most of this work has changed radically. That's the wonderful thing about photography too, you can, you can re-photograph things over and over again because they're constantly changing. Do you, do, would you re-photograph them from different spots? Have you ever done that, taken one subject and shot all the way around or well, made a I usually, story out of? Um, I usually try to consider what, what is the optimum a uh, photograph. I swear, because it's your eye. Optimum being like, I mean, basically it's a matter of standing in the right place at the right time and putting the frame, which is like absolutely critical in photography because that's really what you, all you have to work with, uh, and where you put the frame. And um, sounds simple, but coordinating all those things uh, together. But it couldn't happen again. I mean, it's that one moment. No, well, tomorrow at the same time, the sun's in a different position anyway. And uh, Same thing with this, this photograph. Like, you wouldn't get those clouds in the background, perhaps, or the shadows the way they are. Right. Well, I may not be moved to or inspired to do it again anyway. Um, <laughs> but there is, you know, when I think about it, the the material available for photographing is absolutely inexhaustible. And uh, I used to think that traveling to exotic places was really what I needed to do to make photographs. And eventually I, I um, came to the realization that really, if you know what you're doing with a camera, you can make interesting photographs out of almost anything. Well, your photographs have been shown in museums across the country, all over the world. And people look at photographs and don't a lot of people don't think it's an art form or it shouldn't be in a museum. Do you have any um, Well, that's, an e or that's a very easy uh, prejudice to understand in many ways. Photography is one of the most abused mediums that uh, is capable of being in its highest, in its, when it's practiced in its highest level, is, is, you know, there's no question in my mind that it's an art form. Unfortunately, uh, most of the photography that people experience is not, uh, is a long way from being an art form. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's an abused medium that, is, um, that people uh, understandably don't take too seriously. This piece that we have here is something that I think someone could say this belongs in a museum or this looks like a painting. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why, because it looks like a painting or because it's in color. 
Yeah, this is one of the few. I haven't, I haven't done a lot of color photographs for, my, for myself. Uh, this is um, uh, part of a series I did of paint tubs, and in fact there's... Uh, is there another one under it? Yes. There's a whole series of these, and in fact they're all identically uh, made as photographs, even though the tubs were all different sizes. They're from a paint factory where artist colors were mixed. Uh -huh. um, and one of, one of the things I enjoyed with this series, it's similar to a lot of the industrial things I've done, is the is the um, consistency of subject matter and the and the variety of photographs I could make out of a out of a very um, similar type of subject matter. Um, I could have gone on f photographing these for years. I did I, I did about twenty of them in fact, and they I do exhibit them as a as a body of work. You have several galleries that, who represent your work across America and I guess in Australia as well. Mm -hmm. Rosamund Felsen in Los Angeles has had several of your exhibitions and um, while you were here, when you moved here from Australia in the late 70s, uh, early 80s you got an NEA grant which shows the art connection I think. Mm -hmm. No, that was, um, I was very fortunate to receive that grant and in fact it happened it happened at a time when I was uh, questioning whether I could really uh, afford to stay in America much longer, th oh. and um, so it was perfect timing, and it and it helped me continue working as an artist, and um, I'm still here. It really helped. <laughs> it helped uh, you, and it helped us, and I think you brought some new insight into photography. I know you did all the photographs for the Louis Kahn. Um, exhibition, a mm -hmm. great architect, you photographed those things, and I know Mrs. Khan gave you the big stamp of approval, because when we were at MoCA, she was... Oh, well, she's a tough critic. Yes. She is a tough mm -hmm. critic, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Grant Mudford, and thanks to all of you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to us uh, at 520 South Grand, 8th floor, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.